part two of interview with Thomas Stefanko on August 31st, 2015. Tommy, we're going to switch gears completely now and talk a little bit about the daily life. It's your new home for a year in Baghdad, Iraq. How did you stay in touch with family when you were overseas? Um, that's kind of a double-edged sword because in the, in the information age, um, contact is immediate and that's a bad thing for a commander because we had instances of people being under fire and calling home on cell phones. Uh, we, it was almost impossible to control cell phones when there's thousands of them across the country. So the, the unit leadership is, is very, very demanding in saying what can and cannot be said operational-wise, um, OPSEC-wise, you know, there has to be operation security on everything and information security on everything because we had, there's insurgents all around us. They're in our camps, they're everywhere with us. So we would have to, and it's, a, it's something that I do to this day, is um, shred every piece of paper that has any information on it because we would find kids upside down in the dumpsters pulling out in any information that they could find on us or, or our families and sell that to the uh, to the uh, leadership. So cell phones are a very bad thing when it comes to combat. It's also a very bad thing to stay in touch with your family. You have to be mission focused all the time, 24-7. And that's impossible when you just got off the phone with your wife and you found out the water heater blew up. And and uh, the, the basement flooded. And the, the kid really had a bad day in his first day of school. And by the way, Dad, you weren't there to, for his first day of school, so you're a, you're a, you're an SOB anyway. So staying in touch was very very easy because we we're in a main headquarters, and we had uh, cell phones readily available to us. And even our landlines were capable of direct dial back to the states, which was uh, almost unheard of back then. Well, every soldier had a uh, AT and T calling card, and these are donations from un um, service organizations that helped us mobilize. So you could call anywhere. You had calling cards. Um, email was was a a great way. Again, it's a two-edged sword. It's a great way to stay in touch with your family. Uh, you might not want to stay in touch with your family on a daily basis. So you try to limit that to your downtime. You try to limit that to to a time that really doesn't have any impact on, on mission accomplishment. And there was a, um, there was a nine hour difference also. So I would, I would say good night to my family and my family would say good morning to me at the same time, which was, which was kind of neat, but there was, there was a nine hour difference. Wow. How about the food? What was the food like? Did you have a regular dining facility right there on base? Three yeah. meals a day? Yeah. Well, um, that's kind of a double-edged sword, too, because it's four meals a day. It, because it's midnight rations. You run a 24-hour shift, so you have mid-rats. And if, you're, if, you, if your job is sedentary, you better get your ass to the gym and start running on the treadmill, because you're going to put on weight. Um, because there's, there's nowhere to go, because there's uh, HESCO walls, HESCO barriers all around you. The international zone is only four and a half square miles, and when they weren't throwing mortars and rockets at us, I would go out every morning and run around unless we were in a lockdown situation. Um, and you would, uh, usually on a daily basis, you would hear, we call it the giant voice, the big voice. You would hear, take cover, take cover, take cover. Um, mortar rounds are in, imminent, rocket rounds are imminent. But it was so stupid because it, you would hear the giant voice usually after the mortar rounds fell. And it got to be laughable after a while, take cover, take cover, take cover, when 30 seconds earlier you'd, you'd, mortar rounds would fall in your, in your area. So the food was good. I never had a problem. A lot of people had problems with the food. It's cafeteria style. It's army uh, chow. It's, it's defect type chow. But there's, it's high carbs, high fat. And you know what struck me? I was in a Muslim country, and we had pork for every meal. 
I couldn't understand that. And I'm thinking to myself, you think that's one of the reasons why we're such ugly Americans? We have, you'd have that much bacon on your plate if you wanted it in the morning. You could have sausage, you could have pork chops, you could have any type, any, any portion of that pig that you wanted, and we're in a Muslim country. So, and we have Muslims working for us all the time. So I, I, it, it was strange, but the food was, the food was, some meals weren't on, on every payday. You'd have uh, surf and turf. You'd have lobster tails. They were only about that big, little tiny lobster tails. But it was a lobster tail. It was overcooked. It was hard rubber. But it was a lobster tail. I never got that at home. And then you would have a little steak that was also overcooked and about that thick. But uh, it was great. Um, they would try to pull out all the stops for food at the holidays. The holidays were by far the worst time ever in Baghdad because it was, it was that it sprinkled with all that homesickness stuff. And the more they tried to make it look like home, the more homesick you got and it, it, the more horrible it got. So all you wanted to do was to get through the holiday. You know, the, the special turkey dinners, the Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter, um, all those uh, Fourth of July, um, you know, hot, hot dogs on the grill, uh, dodging mortar rounds for the Fourth of July. It's 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 not the Fourth of July. I, we don't really care about the holidays, but they did a a great job of trying to have that little little piece of home for us. Uh, were there shortages of anything? Did you always have enough supplies, no. and materials of everything you needed? No. No, they'd hit our convoys all the time. The, the one main route in was Route Irish, and whenever Route Irish, there were car bombs on Route Irish, whenever a supply convoy got hit, that means we only had, and that was part of our job in providing supplies, that means that we only had a 24-hour supply of food in the mess hall. That means we only had, there was nothing in the, we had a little chopette, a little PX in our fob. That means you couldn't get toothpaste. So, and there, that's when you relied on donations from home, which were wonderful. I never want to see another Girl Scout cookie for as long as I live. Um, but the, the, the folks for, from home were just sent us everything, except unfortunately you can't send chocolate when it's 130 degrees. You know, a, a wife of one of our soldiers sent a, a five pound bag of M&Ms. He opened it up and it was a very pretty colored goo. So it was, um, but it, it, we were down to MREs on several occasions because they hit a supply convoy. It, did it bother us? No, it didn't, it didn't really bother us. We were all soldiers. It bothered the civilians that were working for the State Department, but it didn't bother us. How did you handle the pressure of the job? You as commander had to be under some pretty heavy stress. How did you handle that stress? It's something that I still do to this day, and I call it the three R's. I'm a military historian, so every chance I get to read, I read. It, if I can get away for a few hours, it was, it was a really big deal for me, and I would, I would try to read something that wasn't job-related. So I'm in a war zone, I'm usually reading about the Civil War. <laughs> You know, something stupid like that. But uh, the next R is uh, is running, and I would have to maintain. It, it's not mental P. It's it's not physical PT, but it's mental PT, and I would run at least four to five days a week. Give my, five days a week. Give myself maybe a couple of days to recover because of the heat, and humidity, and everything. I would. So that's the second R. The third R is religion, and I would. My staff knew that the old man had to go to church. They were trying to get the old man to go to church. And church is sometimes outside, sometimes it's inside. They try to get the old man to go to church on Saturday evenings if, or for 5 o'clock mass. I, had, um, I would take three hours off every week on Sunday morning. I would try to sleep in a little bit, go for a long run, eat like a pig at the mess hall, and then go to work. I'd have three hours off a week where I wasn't mission-focused, unless I didn't have that three hours off a week. But 
The stress was phenomenal. The stress was unbelievable as a commander because, you know, I stand in front of all these moms and dads promising to get their kids home. Um, and we're under mortar and rocket fire on a daily basis. And, uh, you know, in car bombs that would take down a building, car bombs that would take down the side of a building, and it was just, or that would blow you out of your bunk. They were so big. So that, those types of pressures, those types of stress, not only on, for my unit, but the units that I inherited over there, and for the people that are coming and going on a, on a, on a regular basis, to include Department of State um, personnel. So, uh, phenomenal stress. I didn't sleep. I would sleep in, in uh, one and two hour, uh, whenever I could find a chance to sleep. I never took medication to get me to sleep, but uh, it got to the point where it was really starting to affect me. And, uh, and my, my, my team knew that it was affecting me, so um, you know, they would do everything they could to uh, get, get the old man um, to a better place. Did you do anything special for good luck? Wow. I talk about that with my kids all the time. Um, you've heard stories about everyone in combat is, is very religious. Well, it's really true. <laughs> um, I had on my dog tags, uh, Cardinal Egan from the Cardinal of New York at the time uh, blessed a whole box of, for the Catholic members of the unit blessed a whole box of rosaries. So I, I, had a, I had a rosary blessed by Cardinal Egan, usually in my ammo pouch. I had um, St. Christopher taped to my dog tags, and I think I had uh, the Blessed Mother or uh, St. Saint, Saint Michael taped to the other dog tag. So I, t I tell my kids all the time, and, you know, and I, I carried a religious medal that my father carried um, in my in my pocket, so I was I was covered. <laughs> me me and God were pretty tight. Me and God are still pretty tight, but <laughs> but I was covered. What did uh, people do, for, and you personally do for entertainment? Did you have any time downtime at all? I didn't have entertainment. I remember uh, there was entertainers throughout the country all, all the time, but it was just, it was difficult to find entertainment. I know that uh, in the Embassy FOB, there was, uh, there was card nights, there was horseshoe nights, there was dance nights. I wasn't part of any of that, but as long as my soldiers could get off to that kind of stuff. Uh, Toby Keith came to see us, but he was down at Camp Victory, and I was given uh, one helicopter, which would hold 15 soldiers, we could send one helicopter if we wanted to to go see Toby Keith. I could only get probably five or six people into the helicopter. It was such a pain in the ass to travel. Flying was more, a lot more safer than driving. So um, you would you would fly everywhere you go. But every time you flew, it was tough. You had to be manifested. You had to be, you know, given the safety briefs. You had to be in full battle gear. You had to be fully armed, just to fly eight miles to go see Toby Keith, no thanks. I, not, I'll see him when I get home or something. But there was a lot of um, uh, things for the, for the soldiers to do there, um, you know, to, to, get you, to get your mind off of mission, to get your mind off of duty. And, and usually, if you're getting off duty at uh, 2000 or 2100, you, you need a couple of hours to uh, just blow off some steam. Did you ever have any leave or any r, &R? Yeah, yeah. Um, the, everyone is given 10 days of leave. Uh, uh, some soldiers chose not to take it because at the end of your tour you would be paid those 10 days. But everyone is given the opportunity to go to uh, uh, bases in Europe, uh, travel in Europe, or travel in, um, throughout the Middle East, travel in Eastern Europe, um, or to go home on leave uh, for, for 10 full days. It's tough to get there and it's tough to get home because you go from Baghdad 
to southern Baghdad, to Kuwait, and then the, the same trip in reverse, Germany and um, Newfoundland, and then back through Maine and then into Connecticut. It's, it's, it's tough to go on leave, but I, I went on leave and I took the 10 days with my family. It flew by. My mind was still in Iraq. We're fighting a war, and my soldiers' lives were my responsibility, even though I'm on leave. So it was tough for me to take leave, but I'm glad I'm, I did it, and I'm, I'm glad I returned safely. And I, I wouldn't allow myself to take leave until every unit member took leave. So I was way, way almost through this one-year deployment. I was like at the nine or ten-month mark. So when I came back from leave, I knew I only had two months left. So it made it uh, easier. What was your opinion of fellow officers, and what was your opinion of the servicemen underneath you? I still can't say enough for the folks and how mission-focused they were on a regular basis. Did we fight? We fought like families. Did we have? Did we not get along? We didn't get along like families. I mean, if you live in any close proximity to other people in that type of stressful environment, there's going to be fights. There's going to be disagreements. There's going to be horrible knockdown, drag out arguments that you hopefully can pick yourself up and, and go on from. Some relationships were repaired, some relationships weren't repaired, but the, uh, for the most part, the, the core of the officers um, just didn't, never ceased to amaze me. And, and the soldiers, under my command, not under my command, I would, I don't think there was a day that went by that I would say, where the hell do we find these people? Where the hell did we find these people? It was just, some of the things they did were just, it just blew me away on a regular basis. I, the, the American soldier, the American uh, uh, fighting person, it's just, just wonderful. It, it, other things that I guess I shouldn't be surprised with, with the um, being in the National Guard for so many years, those super soldiers that kept the unit together, in peacetime weren't necessarily the super soldiers in, in wartime. So it was, um, but you, you get through all that. You get through all that. Tom, now this is the first war that America's been in where women were actually on the front lines. Did you have any women serving under your command? Yeah, I sure and did. what was that like? They were treated no different than the men. Some of them could kick the hell out of the men. And um, it always bothers me, and they went through everything that we went through. And it always bothers me that when I hear the uninformed talk about women in combat, that they're, it's constitutionally um, illegal to send women into combat. They were in combat every day over there, every damn day. There's a, there's a, a, a little E6 that, and she would I say little because she was short like me, um, who was manning a top turn of a Humvee and, and, and was in a horrendous battle and was awarded the Silver Star. And uh, the, it, more often than not, you saw females either driving or top turret gunners on every convoy that you, that you saw. So they're in all the transportation units. So they're just, they were banned from the combat arms. But uh, yes, I had women in my unit. I had, uh, I think, uh, 28 women in the unit. And like I said, they, were, they did everything that, that all the guys did. Now, you said you had a journal that you wrote in. In fact, you wrote in your journal on that day you were going to be, or the weekend you were going to be retiring, supposedly. Did you continue to write in that journal? I, I, every night before I left my my little plywood office or every night before I, I uh, called it a night, I made it a, I, I don't have a very good memory, so I, I made it part of my routine 
to write at least several sentences a, a day about what happened during that day. Because I'm, I'm at the big boy table now. I'm with generals and admirals and heads of state and, and uh, breaking bread with the vice president of Iraq and, and the secretary general of the, of the, uh, of the council of Iraq and, and uh, ambassadors and senior staffers on a daily basis. So I wanted, while it was still fresh in my mind, I wanted to um, put that on paper. It, uh, sometimes it's tough to read, sometimes it's frustrating, sometimes my frustrations come out on the paper, but, and, and when I came back, I promised that I would keep writing in it, and I didn't. And I, I can pick it up again from um, November of, of 2005 and go on through the rest of my career, and maybe someday I will do that, but um, from what I understand, that journal will be part of this interview for anyone to see. Yes, it will. We'll include that. What were your sleeping quarters like? Where did you, uh, what did you have for barracks? They were um, in Kuwait, they were all tents. In Iraq, we transitioned from, from tents, air-conditioned tents, to they had air-conditioned, um, like a butler building, large open um, metal buildings with just a bunk and a, and a foot locker or a wall locker, and then they transitioned to um, portable trailers. And the a portable trailer was divided, it had a, a, a small latrine, in the middle, it was divided in the middle, and it had billets for four soldiers on each side of the portable trailer. So you have eight soldiers um, potentially sharing sharing a latrine, and then uh, those were the larger ones, and then there were smaller, so that only four soldiers were sharing a latrine. Two bunks on the left, two bunks on the right, and just as far as the eye can see, you know, miles and miles and miles of, uh, of uh, portable trailers. All air conditioned? Yes, all air conditioned. If, if, if it weren't for that, you, no one would have slept. No one would have slept in Iraq. Uh, at, at the end of a duty day in the middle of the summer, it could be, the temperature would drop to 100 degrees from a high of uh, 125, several times 130. I tell my kids all the time, you know how we have uh, snow days in Connecticut? In Iraq, they would have heat days. Whenever the temperature reached uh, uh, 50 Celsius is about 130 degrees. So if it's 50 Celsius, you, you don't have to go to school because none of the schools are air conditioned. There's, there's no furniture. There's a blackboard and the teacher may or may not have a desk or a chair, but it's, uh, it's culture shock. What was your office like? What did you have for a building for that? Uh, we had Saddam Hussein's bombed out Imperial Palace. Now, like most of the, it, it was, I call it Soviet architecture because most of it is a facade. So when you walk into one of Saddam Hussein's palaces, usually the first 50 or 100 feet is just beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And then it's very utilitarian. So with the, with the Americans come in with pallets and pallets of plywood and built plywood boxes all over this. You know, if, talk about fires, and this place did catch on fire and uh, most of the top floor burned away while we were there, but it's a fire trap, it's plywood boxes, and, but some of it is very, very nice. And in some of the offices, you couldn't distinguish it from an office here in in the United States. But my job wasn't in the office, thankfully. My job was out, in a, out and about the entire country of Iraq. Um, as a senior Connecticut Guardsman there, I had the opportunity to visit every guard unit that was there at the time. And I also was responsible for all the FOBs in the area, forward operating bases. Well, so what we would do that. What would a typical day be like for you? There probably wasn't any typical day. No, there's no typical day, but it usually started at, uh, at 4.30 or 5, started with a run, 
some sort of physical fitness uh, training, and then a, a quick shower, and then off to the uh, off to the defac for a a cup of coffee, um, a little box of cereal. And after I left, I found out that Saddam Hussein, who was in captivity just a few miles from us, he liked the same kind of cereal that I ate every morning, which was uh, Raisin Bran Crunch. He liked Raisin Bran Crunch. So I'd usually grab a, a little box of cereal, a carton of milk, big cup of coffee, and then find a TV and listen to CNN, because my sometimes the CNN briefs were a couple of days ahead of my intelligence briefs. <laughs> Sorry, General Casey, I guess I could say that now. But um, a lot of times we would listen to Al Jazeera for up to the minute news, um, Fox News, some of the Arabic channels. And then, um, and then it's to my daily brief with the general or with his senior staff and working on the next project, usually a transition for some of the things that we're doing to the Iraqis or to our units, uh, taking care of regular FOB commander stuff, taking care of reg regular FOB business, going out and about, um, uh, working on the rebuilding effort, setting up some of the infrastructure to help the Iraqis um, uh, set up their new government. I would try to between 9 and 10 at night. So from 5 in the morning to about 10 at night, it's a pretty long day, and then try to wind down. I, I, in reverse, I would try to watch some news at night to find out what I did during the day. And in reverse, I would try to wind down with, you know, uh, with a book or with, uh, yeah, just, or with music. Music was very, very important to me over there to, to try to get me in that frame and then prep for the next day. A lot of soldiers called it Groundhog Day. You know, every day was, was the same. Did you sustain any injuries? I did not. Um, I think I, at some point in my life I will be tested for TBI because I was very, very close to explosions, even though I didn't, and thankfully the shrapnel would go in the direction of the flight of the rocket. I was very close to mortars with the same thing, um, shrapnel all around me, none on me, in me. Um, and TBI is, I was very close to several car bombs that were in excess of 500 pounds, and they say that TBI can, you don't have to have a jarring in your brain, it can come up through the ground, and, and uh, I'm concerned about forgetfulness now, I'm concerned about, I don't know if it's just being old or if it's just being, you know, some of the effects of that, but um, members of my command, had injuries, members of my command were, were very, very close, so in some cases a lot closer than me. But we all had very, very close calls. We were under fire. You know, it, it was an unusual day when you didn't hear rockets and mortars. We landed during Ramadan, and every day during Ramadan was, you know, getting back at the invidals with, with something. So there's direct fire, indirect fire every day. Did your unit sustain any casualties? Um, yes. The, not my soldiers from Connecticut, other than what I just described, but the unit that I had formerly commanded was only eight miles away from me, elements of the 1st Battalion, 100, 102nd Infantry. And um, uh, we had two, they were with a, a group from Arkansas, Cav Scout Group from Arkansas, and they had uh, uh, five KIAs, two of which were from Connecticut, from my former unit. And then we, within our FOB, we had, uh, unfortunately, we had suicides. 
uh, throughout the year. You know, j just for you know various dumb stuff, dear John letters and and uh, pressure and things like that. But um, they would all always hit us pretty hard. Yeah. How many suicides were in your unit? Uh, not in my unit, but it, it, in the fob, in the fobs around us, I can uh, at least five throughout the year. It's just dumb stuff. Dumb stuff. Were there very many John, Dear John letters? Yes. Yeah, and, uh, and, and some of that was self-imposed, I guess, because in a situation like that, um, uh, relationships happen. And it's, I guess you could look back on the stress and look back on, on some of the other things that we're going through, especially with the young soldiers, maybe some who had never been home, uh, away from home before in their lives. So, uh, the, and there's no, we're a big, one big family, and there's no secrets in our one big family. So it was, uh, the, the flow of communication goes both ways. But if we're, if you're talking about casualties, and, and you, and I guess I would be remiss if I didn't talk about a situation that has affected me every day for the rest of my life. It was uh, during one of my trips to uh, Taji to see my old unit. The uh, platoon leader uh, wants me to. Uh, I spend as much time with these folks as I can, and and here's a unit where I say, "Where the hell do we find these guys?" They were absolutely phenomenal. Best infantrymen in, in the world. And the platoon leader wants me to meet one of his platoon studs. He's just a great guy. His name is uh, Robert Hoyt. And Hoyt was just a kid, 19. They were all kids. But, um, uh, you know, he, he's the super soldier. Everything you... And he was singing the praises of this of this kid, and I was embarrassing him a little bit. I was telling him he was too young to shave, and you know, that kind of, just good-natured kidding around. And, and uh, so I coined him, and I shook his hand, and we spent some time together. And it was really a, a very memorable uh, visit. And then about uh, less than two days after that, I fly out. It was also, I'll talk about Fallujah in a little bit, but uh, flying was the safest way to get around Iraq until you lose an engine, and then it's not too safe anymore. So I fly out to uh, to the to the headquarters, and then less than two days later, I'm, I'm called to the uh, the secure phone, the secure line, and the the only way you you go secure is when you have casualties or when you um, you're talking about troop movements, things of that nature. So I was it was the platoon leader. And uh, up from Taji, and he told me that there was a they were escorting an, an Iraqi convoy, and they hit an IED, and there was a lot of casualties, and um, Hoyt was one of the casualties, and he was listed as um, WIA um, NLT, wounded in action, non life threatening, which was good. It's a good thing. So we we, we talked talked about all the. Uh, all the other casualties as well. And then um, less than a couple hours later, I get the call from the same platoon that Hoyt didn't make it. And um, he had massive internal injuries, but when he was first evaluated, he was listed as NLT, non-life-threatening. So, and then there was a lot of things that went wrong that day. He was blown clear of the, of the Humvee but then in all the smoke and confusion and returning fire um, and more ID, IEDs going off, he was, he was actually run over by one of the uh, vehicles in the convoy. So he's waiting by the, he's in a stretcher, waiting, he's in a litter, waiting for a medevac, and everything was going wrong that day. No, couldn't get a medevac didn't know the freaks were wrong on the radios. No one knew who was responsible for the medevacs. And we teach pre-combat checks in every mission that we 
before we go out, beat it into their heads, pre-combat checks, because of stuff like this, because of Murphy's Law. And he was on the litter, and his platoon mates were gathered around him, and they were holding his hand. And um, as he's being lifted into the um, medevac, he, he grabs her hands and he says, um, I love you guys. And no one knew the uh, severity, but, um, you know, it's stuff like that that'll, that'll stay with me forever. Before that, while I was still here, but right before we were sent over, um, another soldier from my unit, who I knew, uh, was Felix Del Greco, and, and uh, when he got to his fob and Taji, they had only been in place for less than 72 hours, and he was shot in the head. One of their, one of their uh, first missions, he was shot in the head by a sniper. And uh, he was, uh, it was emotional for all of us. So we know it's war, we know things are going to happen, and we know we're going to lose soldiers. And then there were several members of the same unit from Arkansas that were, that were killed at the same time. So, you know, you're reminded of, of the war on a daily basis. No matter what you do, um, no matter how cheery they try to make Christmas for you, um, you're st still in a war, and, you, and it's your mission to make these people and the soldiers un, uh, under your command to remain focused, especially as you get towards the end of your tour, to don't do anything stupid. Remain focused and to not let your guard down and, and uh, you know, get through this. Tommy, were you awarded any medals or citations? I know you were. Um, can you tell me about a few of them? We'll actually attach a list to your uh, collection. Yeah, I was I was awarded the Brown Star. For what? For actions as a unit, actions as the commander of this wonderful team of of professionals that helped stand this brand new country up. Um, so when I talk about it, I talk about the unit that that allowed me to wear this this award. I was also awarded the Legion of, of Honor, the Legion of Merit. And we were awarded, we were the first unit from what I can understand in all of my historical research, that were awarded the Department of State Superior Service Award, the Department of State um, Medal of Merit, and the Joint Unit, um, the JMUA, the Joint Meritorious Unit Award. So those are four awards that I can never find from any of the units that preceded us or, or uh, replaced us that have ever been awarded throughout the history of the United States Army. And um, I get to stand in front of this, this unit and I get to take credit for what these guys and gals did, but they were just phenomenal. They earned those awards. Um, and yes, that's all on my DD-214, almost 30 years of awards. and. Frankly, most of these are in my basement in boxes, and I, not because I downplay the importance of these awards, it's just I don't, I'm just not the type of showy person to put them on my walls. Um, but I'm very, I can't say how proud I am of these individuals. And I think this might be a good opportunity to meet for me to verbatim read the accomplishments of this of this one unit, who, by the way, was responsible for the first free and fair elections, democratically run elections in Iraq in the last fifty years. We did it. No matter what you hear on the in the, reading the textbooks, 
we were, during the day of the elections, we were told to get out of camera range, but we did it. We Americans did it. My joint area support group did it. My 143rd did it. So we, we ran the first elections. You see all the people with their purple finger. And in any given day, we'd normally get about 50, 45 to 50 attacks in our area of operations on any given day. The bad guys tried to infiltrate us, and we had over 150 attacks on the day of the elections. We didn't lose anybody at the polling sites. Every, it was like the Iraqi Fourth of July. Everyone went out to vote. And they, they were just, they, it was, they were picnicking and partying, and uh, it was just a wonderful day. But we did it. Wow. So I'd like to read the accomplishments. And now I, I may include these uh, with, the, with my journal, but we were the chief financial officers for $22 billion, that's billion with a B, in reconstruction funds. We had $110 million in operations and, and uh, maintenance funds, and that consisted of uh, DOD's largest ever cash disbursement. We managed all the international zone real property. We developed the international zone master plan, which I still have a copy of, by the way, that we, that took a lot of work. We transitioned uh, the property to the uh, interim Iraqi government. We provided life support for 20,000 20, plus residents within the international zone and we provided force protection for 4,000 embassy personnel. We managed all fixed and rotary wing air missions in our area of, area of responsibility, and we ran all armored convoys between the international zone and uh, Baghdad International Airport. We safely moved thousands of personnel each week in this manner. We coordinated all security within the international zone and the uh, interim Iraqi government agencies, and that's what provided the success of our security, provided the Iraqis to go out and vote for the first time in 50 years. For all of these accomplishments, we were awarded the Joint Meritorious Unit Award, the United States Embassy Unit of Excellence, and we were nominated for the Department of State Meritorious Service Medal, service ribbon that was awarded about a year, about a year and a half after we came back from this deployment. So I, I wanted to read those verbatim because I don't want to leave anything out if, for pos posterity uh, if great. I'm going. Wow, that's a lot to be proud of, uh, certainly historic. Tommy, you were going to tell me something about Fallujah. What happened in Fallujah? Were you at Fallujah? I was, I was at Fallujah during combat operations in November of, of uh, 2004. And I was at Fallujah after com immediately after combat operations in 2004. And we worked with a Marine unit, and I believe it was 1-3 uh, Marines or 3-5 Marines, on... Um, setting up secure checkpoints so that the residents of Fallujah could get back to their city after this horrendous battle was over. And I have a lot of photos of Fallujah, and, I have a, and, and Fallujah was... It looked like one of the Pacific Islands at the end of World War II. Um, there wasn't a house that wasn't um, bullet-scarred or, or battle-damaged at the end of this, or bomb damaged. And, and we did a, a, a lot with security to try to get the checkpoints up and running. And the Marines were the ultimate professionals and the ultimate warfighters when it came to that section of Fallujah that I was in. Because if it, if it moved and it looked like an insurgent, it died. And there was a lot of, uh, we saw a lot of evidence of uh, intravenous drug use by the Iraqis. First of all, the Iraqi leadership left their soldiers to die in place, and they left them with a lot of drugs. So a lot of times these Iraqi soldiers had to be shot three, four, five times because they were on, on drugs. Um, we 
saw Blackwater Bridge, and uh, I have photos of Blackwater Bridge where the uh, four Blackwater employees, Americans, were where they ended up after being killed, uh, beheaded, dismembered, and their torsos dr uh, dragged through the streets of Fallujah. And then they were hung on meat hooks at Blackwater Bridge, and the meat hooks and the uh, cables were still there where the Americans were, were, uh, were hung. Um, flying out of Fallujah, I, I just brought up Fallujah because uh, after working with the uh, and seeing this devastation up close and personal after working with the Marines. We were flying back, um, and we lost an engine in the, uh, in the aircraft, and we, we made it back. What aircraft were you it, was, it was in a UH-60. They're, they're, uh, it's a helicopter, Blackhawk, and they have two engines. And uh, when you lose an engine, in all of my training that I've ever been through, you you know, you, you're on the ground immediately. Um, but we're in Anbar province and we're in the middle of the desert. And uh, um, if we had landed, the uh, chances, <laughs> chances are I wouldn't be giving you this wonderful interview here today. But uh, uh, we kind of limped in and, uh, on one engine. And that was, uh, that was a very exciting thing to happen in Iraq. And then every time I flew in Iraq, we get shot at, but it got to be laughable after a while because the Iraqis were just horrible marksmen. Um, because we would fly at about 150 knots, about 100 feet off of the ground. So it's the wildest ride you ever want to take in your life. We would have to gain elevation to go over a utility wire and then back down to the deck again. And more, more often than not, you would hear the automatic weapons fire but you would see tracers usually 200 meters in back of you. And at night, you would see tracers even farther in back of you. They're, you're getting shot at all the time, but the, the, they're just horrible shots. And we're blacked out, and they, can't, they can hear the helicopter. But by the time that you're, they don't know how to lead the helicopter and how to properly engage a helicopter, so by the time you're, you're, you're long gone by the time you're receiving fire. So it got to be kind of laughable. We, we laughed a, a lot about stuff that could potentially kill us. But that's just the way it was. Do you have any other memorable experiences or incidents from your time in Iraq? It, it was all memorable. Um, I, having dinner with the with the heads of state, um, having dinner with the vice president of Iraq, um, breaking bread with the the entire IIG, the interim Iraqi government, it was all memorable. It, I always try to remind myself that I will never be in a situation like this again. To sit at a table with a bunch of to be the lowest, as a colonel, to be the lowest ranking person and the mayor of the city, the lowest ranking person at a table with general officers who are bitching to me about their, you know, their stake was overdone in the mess hall. I, <laughs> I couldn't believe stuff like that because general, I wanted to say general, your soldiers are out there eating out of cans, okay? So, but I, I didn't do that. So it was all memorable. The, the Muslim culture, Working with the Iraqis, working with the Sunnis and the Shias, understanding now that, that the, they will never be friends, working with the Kurds, um, o almost losing my life uh, to, to uh, Kurdistani soldiers um, who don't really think that they're Iraqis, um, seeing signs like, if you drive here, you will be shot. If you cross this line, you will be shot. Um, the the explosions, the car bombs, the mortars, the rockets, the trying to get to normalcy, the, trying to a little piece of America, trying to um, just every part of it was memorable, and that's why I kept a journal, and that's why I kept so so many. That's why I took so many photos 
a lot of times I didn't have ammo in my ammo pouches. I had a camera. I had a camera in one ammo pouch, and I usually, you know those little boxes of cereal that I got every morning? I usually had boxes of cereal in the other ammo pouch. So God forbid if they start shooting at me. <laughs> so, so I could probably throw the camera and the box of cereal at them. But, uh, uh, you know, all of that was memorable. It was just an, an unbelievable experience. And hopefully we made it easier. I know we made it easier for the units that, that, um, that replaced us. Because we didn't leave there until, damn it, the unit was ready to replace us. And uh, for that, I'm very, very proud of my team again. Do you recall your last day in Iraq? Yeah, sure do. What was that like? It was, uh, it was bittersweet. I was the last person from my unit to, have, to physically have my boots off of the ground and into the helicopter. And they always tell you not to sit in the hell hole. The hell hole is the helicopter seat where, because of the uh, counterclockwise rotation of the rotors, all of the rotor wash goes into the, the, the rear <coughs> right passenger seat. So they always tell you not to sit in the hell hole. All the other seats were filled, so all the commander sits in the hell hole. And I'm getting the shit kicked out of me as we're lifting off, and I want this to be a memorable experience for me, and I'm lifting off from, from our pad, and I'm watching Baghdad kind of fade away, and, uh, and you know I, the rotor wash is just really killing me at this point. But it was, it was very memorable. And then we got to... Uh, it did everything in reverse order. We got to... Camp Victory, we're back in tents again, and uh, and I'm I know that we have to stay in Victory, train a lineup transportation a C-17 out of Al Udeed Air, Air Force Base in Kuwait. We're trying to get transportation back, and I'm running. It's hot. God, it's hot. It's got to be 120 degrees. I'm running first thing in the morning, and I'm I'm at Camp Victory, and um, I hear the explosions. After a year of explosions, now I'm somewhat safe, eight miles away from where I was, the longest eight miles in the history of the world, and I hear the explosions and I see the, the uh, smoke clouds in the distance, and I'm saying to myself, Jesus Christ, not now. I am so close to home, and now I'm being mortared again. And I'm saying, not now. So, um, uh, Everything turned out okay. Reverse, reverse order from Camp Victory to, down to Al Yadid. And then um, the Big Freedom Bird stayed there for a little while at the Air Force Base. And then the Big Freedom Bird is a C 17. C 17, um, all to ourselves. And we fly that C 17 um, from Camp Victory down to Al Yadid which was wonderful. And then in al Yadid we got a, a commercial chartered small plane, like a C-7 or something like that, maybe a 727, very old, very small, only holds about 150 or so. And we flew that from Kuwait into Romania. Why? I have no idea. But we were in Romania, and then we flew to. There was a short, it had short legs, so we needed a lot of gas. And then we flew from Romania to Germany, and then we flew from Germany to Iceland. And and uh, picture this, folks. <laughs> whoever reads this, whoever looks at this in the future, you got a you got a hundred plus folks just left the desert, and it's hot, 120 degrees. We land, we're taxiing up to the terminal, Air Force terminal in Iceland, where everyone's face is glued to the windows in this plane because it's snowing. We've, it, it rained about five times while, during the year that we were in Baghdad. It rained about five times. You could literally count it on one hand, and it rains for 20 minutes at a time. No water. So now we fly into Iceland and we see snow for the first time after coming out of the desert. Then we fly from Iceland to Bangor, Maine, 
unless it was Newfoundland, to Bangor, Maine, and then we land in Bangor, Maine, and we're greeted like heroes, which we're not, by all of, of service organizations and the veterans waving flags and shaking our hands and welcoming us home, USO type stuff with coffee and donuts and stuff. And we might have we might have landed in Iceland, and no, before Iceland, I think we went to Ireland, and in Ireland, it was about uh, three or four in the morning, and they opened a bar for us, and we got some, we got some beer in Ireland, and then from there, Iceland, and then Bangor, Maine, and then uh, uh, back to Fort Drum, New York. So, and then Fort Drum, New York, out processing, turning in of gear, and then Fort Drum, New York, bus convoy back to Newington, Connecticut, uh, where the governor met us and, you know, bittersweet stuff because home will never be, home will never, that year of dreaming at that past year, it'll never be like that. So it was, it was very bittersweet, but we all made it back. Were you discharged when you got back to Connecticut or did you no. still stay in? Um, when I returned to Connecticut, I was offered, I, I remained as the commander of the 143rd ASG for the next uh, three or four months to turn in the unit and to uh, transition the unit. And then I was offered the uh, plans operations and training officer for the state of Connecticut. And I stayed as the plans operations and training officer until I was offered a position to teach junior ROTC at uh, Crosby High School in Waterbury. And I only stayed there for probably s six or eight weeks, less, less than two months. And then I received a call from the Adjutant General who offered me a command to uh, go back on active duty as the commander of the uh, 169th Leadership Regiment at Camp Niantic and I remained on active duty for another year and a half after that. So, and then brought me up to uh, uh, the end of 2008 when I retired. And then I, my current position is the director of the Advoc Office of Advocacy and Assistant, Connecticut Department of Veterans Affairs. And uh, I have offices throughout the state where we assist veterans with uh, disability compensation and pension claims. Wow. Do you still stay in touch with any of your fellow service members? Yeah. Um, being in Veterans Affairs puts me in direct contact with all service members. So whether I want to or not, I'm in contact with all of my, my brothers and sisters. But we uh, last year we had a 10-year anniversary of our deployment. Um, and we all got together. We get together, we see each other for promotions and going away ceremonies and things like that, but we had a 10-year anniversary for the uh, anniversary of the deployment, and this is my 10th anniversary for my demobilization. So hurricane, when Hurricane Katrina hit, uh, we had a unit from New Orleans with us that we had to release to go back. Their Air Force Base was just wiped out and I'll remember the name of their Air Force Base. But um, that was happening while we were transitioning to go to be demobilized in Iraq. So this is my 10th year anniversary of my uh, demobilization. Although it, looking back through the photos and the deployment journal and all of that, it feels like uh, yesterday. I guess it'll always feel like yesterday. Did you form any close relationships while you were in the service that you still maintain? Yes. Yes, a lot of my senior leadership, um, and a lot of my senior leadership, a lot of my junior leadership are the same rank that I was when I retired. So they're now all colonels, and they worked for me when they were lieutenants and captains. So, um, and, and I love these people. I absolutely love these people, and it's so wonderful, wonderful for, for me to see that maybe I did something right. And, and for these folks are still around and they're all colonels right now. And uh, like I said, um, I think Shakespeare was onto something when 
when he when he wrote that uh, from Henry V, the Fifth Band of Brothers. Uh, we we men we marry men we band of brothers. So. Tom, did you join any veterans organizations? I I didn't, and they were so good to me when we were deployed because they sent us care packages. I speak to veteran service organizations all the time now. Um, I went to several meetings in my hometown, and I'm an old fart, but uh, sometimes I would, first of all, there, there was way too much cigarette smoking and way too much drinking, and I would look around the room and I would say to myself, holy cow, I'm the, I'm the youngest person here. So it, things have changed a little bit, but I, and then raising a young family and still being on active duty, I, uh, I didn't join any veteran service organizations. How would you say that your military service affected your life? It is my life. There, there's no life prior to the military. And I hate to say it, there's not much of a life after the military. Um, and I tell people, I hear this a lot from Vietnam vets, um, and I heard it from the Vietnam vets who I served with, and I would, the big question I would ask was, when were you in Vietnam? And the, and the answer always is, last night. So, I don't dream about Iraq, but I dream about the military every night. I'm in uniform every night. So, so it, it, there is no other life. Um, the 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 most proud accomplishment throughout my entire life will be that I was a soldier. How would you feel if your children wanted to join the military? I would, I would support them 110%. Absolutely. It's, it's a, you may not deploy. You're not going to get shot at. You're not going to die. It's a wonderful education. It's a wonderful way to learn leadership. It's a wonderful way to, to expand whatever you want to do in life um, to join the military. And it's responsible for all of my college education. It's responsible for everything that I, that I am. So I, in, in, in Iraq, I said I wasn't going to die. I, I was there with 140,000 soldiers. So... Um, it's a wonderful career. It's a, it's, a, it's a profession. Tom, is there anything else that you'd like to add that we haven't covered? Any other memorable incidents that, that I didn't ask about? Uh, uh, thanks to you, I think I'll be in therapy for the next couple of weeks. <laughs> but uh, but uh, um, it, I, I was pressured to be here. I didn't want to tell this story, but I was pressured to be here because it's a story that needed needed to be told. But not by me. No. No, my, my brothers and sisters in uniform and, and my fellow retirees. So and I, I firmly believe that and I want to give the proper credit to the soldiers that got me here. So that's why I'm here. And I I, I want to thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you for sharing your story and thank you for your service.